Yeah. You were the offender. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now quit having the, the, impar, in, the inappropriate ex parte, off the record discussions, and we'll get these judges sworn in. Right, Dana? After a short delay, I call the committee to order. The Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet will now come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time, and with votes expected around 1130, that is likely to happen. We, we today are examining new, uh, new judges needed for the Federal Circuit, and other items that may come up in questioning. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. This is one of the most important things that Congress does, is determine how many lifetime appointments are necessary to meet the requirements of the Federal Court is given by the American people. Many of those requirements come from direct uh, addresses to the federal court under uniquely federal requirements, such as patent or immigration. And in the Southern District of California, we're particularly familiar with both. But many also come from a growing tendency for states to recognize that they can save money, be very efficient, by using every trick in the book to get something into the federal court. This, oddly enough, sometimes goes in reverse when it is more favorable to be in state court, but we have seen a growing docket of items that could be tried in state court but are tried in federal court. These tend to be often criminal, and as a result, they take priority. Notwithstanding how we get where we are, today the federal court system is backed up. It is backed up not because of an inherent inefficiency, but because of a growing caseload. This is particularly true with the latest re request for my home state and its Ninth Circuit. With 21 requested judges at the district court level and five more for what is already, by a factor of two, the largest uh, appellate court in the nation, we are at a crisis point. We must have the judges to take care of the caseload. We must find ways to make sure that justice, as it has been historically known, is, is kept. As so often has been said, justice delayed is justice denied. We cannot have that. At the same time, at least in the Ninth Circuit, we're acutely aware that the term full en banc simply doesn't mean anything. You will get a mini group of judges. The judges are unpredictable, and they represent already about a third uh, of the judges that are in the full uh, court, and that will continue to be that way until some change is found. So today, in addition to the request for judges and the merit and other questions back and forth, it is our goal to also talk about the efficiency of courts at the district level and the efficiency of courts at the appellate level and ask our distinguished panel of judges and practitioner uh, for their suggestions, if known, of areas in which we could mitigate the inevitable need for more judges. Notwithstanding that, this is one of those rare bipartisan uh, or even nonpartisan hearings with the possible exception of a tweet from the president which will certainly loom over this, today, this hearing today. And with that, I'd like to recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. I'm going to uh, yield to the ranking member of the full committee will yes. now be recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, access to justice is not just a political slogan, it is a constitutional guarantee. But in some federal judicial districts, this promise meets the reality of an overburdened and understaffed court that cannot keep up with a burgeoning caseload. 
As a result, cases can be delayed or rushed, and justice may be shortchanged. To help address this problem, every two years, the Judicial Conference of the United States analyzes the workload and the resources of all U.S. Courts of Appeal and U.S. District Courts and recommends to Congress new judgeships to ease the burden of courts that are stretched too thin. In March 2017, the Judicial Conference recommended the creation of five new judgeships in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and 52 new judgeships in 23 district courts throughout the country. I appreciate the thoughtful analysis conducted by the Judicial Conference, and we should consider its recommendations carefully. I cannot help but note, however, the context in which this hearing occurs. It just so happens that we have a Republican Senate busily confirming a Republican President's judges at a historic rate, some of them, I might add, with dubious qualifications and many with alarming views. I certainly hope the purpose of this hearing truly is to assist overburdened courts and that it is not, in fact, intended to lay a foundation for assisting President Trump in carrying out his plan to pack the courts with ideologically extreme judges. We should remember that it was only five years ago that the full Judiciary Committee held a hearing titled, Are More Federal Judges Always the Answer? The hearing was meant to call attention to the supposedly outrageous fact that President Obama had nominated judges to fill the existing vacancies on the D.C. Circuit. Those were not new judgeships that he hoped to create. He simply nominated candidates to fill existing vacancies on what is generally considered the most important court in the country besides the Supreme Court. But Republicans cried foul and declared that the president was attempting to pack the court. They also noted that each new judgeship could cost as much as a million dollars a year to support, which they considered an unused wise, an unwise use of resources. They sang a different tune, however, in 2002 when President George Bush was in office. The Constitution Subcommittee then held a hearing called A Judiciary Diminishes Justice Denied, the Constitution, the Senate, and the Vacancy Crisis in the Federal Judiciary. The Democratic Senate, they argued, was creating a judicial crisis because it was not confirming President Bush's nominees quickly enough. But they hardly seemed to complain during the final two years of the Obama presidency when Senate Republicans confirmed the fewest judges since 1952 leaving over 100 vacancies unfilled for President Trump to then fill. And when Justice Scalia passed away, Republicans cheered the Senate's refusal even to schedule a hearing on President Obama's nomination of Judge Merrick Garland. It did not seem to trouble them at all that a seat on the highest court in the land remained vacant for more than a year because it paved the way eventually for Justice Gorsuch to be confirmed. I provide all this history not to take anything away from the Judicial Conference or its nonpartisan and highly professional recommendations. But it is worth noting that there is another set of judgeship recommendations floating around conservative circles right now. This one was developed by Stephen Calabrese, a founder of the Federalist Society, whose plan would add 61 new federal appellate, court, uh, new, new federal appellate circuit court judges, a 36% increase, and 200 new district court judges, almost 30% more than the current figure. Unlike the Judicial Conference, which conducted a careful study, of the needs throughout the judicial system, Professor Calabrese's proposal, he makes clear, was developed in part to, quote, undo President Obama's judicial legacy, unquote. In fact, President Trump is already hard at work on radically reshaping the federal judiciary. Never before have we seen a president essentially outsource the process of selecting judicial nominees to ideologically driven organizations like the Federal Society and the Heritage Foundation. As a result, we have seen a host of troubling nominations. More than one has been unable or unwilling to answer whether Brown versus Board of Education was correctly decided. One nominee said that transgender children were part of, quote, Satan's plan, unquote. <coughs> and several nominees have been rated flatly unqualified by the American Bar Association. Unfortunately, that has not stopped the Senate from confirming the President's nominees at a historic pace. We should, of course, consider the merits of the Judicial Conference's proposals, regardless of who holds the levers of power at any given time, with the understanding that this hearing is not a pretext for any larger goals. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. And with that, I'd like to go to the ranking member of the subcommittee for his opening statement, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This hearing gives us an opportunity to examine whether there is a need for additional federal judgeships. The United States legal system is the envy of the world. Our legal system has historically provided fair, timely, 
an expert adjudication of civil disputes and criminal prosecutions for hundreds of years. There are, however, a number of challenges facing our federal legal system that must be addressed if it is to maintain the standard of service our citizens expect and deserve. One of these challenges is an overworked judiciary. As a former magistrate judge, I continue to support restoring judicial compensation to appropriate levels and efforts to add judges where needed. Every other year, the Judicial Conference provides updated recommendations to Congress about the number of authorized judgeships needed to meet the needs of the American judicial system. Federal District Court judges are appointed under Article III of the Constitution and are nominated by the President, confirmed by the Senate, and serve lifetime appointments on good behavior. Upon good behavior, excuse me. In March 2017, the Judicial Conference recommended to Congress to create five permanent Article III judgeships in the Courts of Appeals and 52 permanent Article III judgeships. The Judicial Conference also recommended the conversion to permanent status of eight temporary judgeships in the district courts. In addition, the Judicial Conference recommended to Congress and the President that they not fill the next judgeship vacancy on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit and in the District Court of Wyoming based on consistently low filings in both courts. The Judicial Conference's recommendations are based on a comprehensive analysis of the workload of federal judges, which takes into consideration not only the number, but also the nature and complexity of the cases before the various courts. The number of federal judges has an impact on the speed of federal cases heard. The last time there was a major increase in judges was in 1990, when 61 new permanent judgeships were authorized. Since 1990, appeals filings have grown 40 percent, and district court filings have grown 38 percent. While we may need additional judges, we must also make sure that the individuals nominated are qualified. I've been alarmed by some of the appointments that President Trump has made for new judges. And I continue to believe that if my Senate Republican colleagues were concerned about efforts for new judges to manage caseloads, they could have helped address that concern by confirming Merrick Garland promptly and President Obama's other outstanding nominees who were left on the table. I'm particularly interested to hear the witnesses discuss which areas of the country need more judges and how an increase in judgeships would impact the judiciary and also the lives of everyday Americans. The Judicial Conference has recommended one additional permanent judge for the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia which is uh, my home circuit. I have always supported highly qualified candidates to the federal bench, particularly in the Northern District of Georgia. The district is currently allotted 11 judgeships. As I stated earlier, I support efforts for additional federal judges where needed. I thank the chairman for holding this hearing, and I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio will provide the majority chairman's statement and, and uh, excerpts of his own. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I hadn't really planned on making any remarks, but I'll be very brief in light of a couple of comments that I heard from my dear friends on the other side of the aisle. One, uh, the reference to uh, how alarm alarming uh, that this president's uh, nominees have, have been in, in some cases. Um, I have to say, as a relatively conservative guy myself, I was I found it kind of alarming some of the, uh, the nominations by the, the previous uh, administration. So it oftentimes depends on who's I'm not sure what that. Somebody doesn't like what's being said here. Who apparently. says the Russians don't listen? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, relative to whether something is alarming or not, I think oftentimes uh, depends on whose axe is being gored, and uh, so. The fact that uh, a number of the 
uh, nominees tend to be a bit more conservative uh, this time around than last time around. It's probably not, not surprising, but I don't think it's necessarily uh, alarming, and I, I certainly don't think it's – it was mentioned that it's either unprecedented uh, or it never happened before, the so-called outsourcing of the nominees to such conservative organizations as the – uh, as heritage, uh, uh, for example, I would, I would make the point that I think uh, many uh, in the Obama administration and previous more, uh, more uh, liberal administrations uh, tended to get a lot of their nominees uh, uh, from organizations which were, were on the left. So I don't think there's anything unprecedented or alarming or surprising. Um, about that. And I would just finally conclude by, uh, you know, the Bar Association was mentioned and the fact that some of these folks uh, that the Trump administration has, uh, has nominated uh, for federal judicial positions uh, have, uh, have not been approved by the Bar Association or not held in high repute. I would just note that uh, I practiced law for almost two decades before coming to Congress about 22 years ago and uh, had been a longtime member of the American Bar Association, paid the dues every year, even though I was just a sole practitioner. So it was, you know, 250 bucks at that time was a fair amount of money when you're a sole practitioner. Um, and used to like to get their magazine, et cetera, until they decided that it was, uh, they just had to uh, take a point of view on the life issue. And I happened to be pro-life and they happened to decide that uh, on behalf of all the lawyers in this country that they decided that the pro-choice uh, point of view was the only position that was appropriate uh, and uh, didn't pay my dues after that. And uh, once in a while I'd stop by the library and read the publication for free, but I wasn't going to pay my dues anymore to the Bar Association. So oftentimes uh, it just sort of depends on, as I say, whose acts is being uh, gored and uh, uh, but our federal judiciary, whichever side of the aisle one, one finds himself here, I think we all agree that, that we do need quality people on the, on the federal benches, whether it's at the district court or circuit court, certainly at the U.S. Uh, S Supreme Court level. So uh, I know we have a very distinguished uh, panel here in front of us this morning and look forward to hearing their testimony. I might add that I also am chairman of the House Small Business Committee, and we have one of my subcommittee hearings going on. So. I, I do intend to stick around for, for all the testimony, I, I hope, but I do have to get over there. And I want to thank the, the gentleman for the way he's run this, this committee over the years, and I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we now move forward with the most important part of this for most witnesses and an unusual part for our witnesses today, and that is pursuant to the rules of the committee. Would you please all rise to take the oath? Raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Today, our distinguished panel of witnesses include Judge Lawrence Stiegel, the chair of the Committee on Judicial Resources of the Judicial Conference of the United States, as such, the man who brought us here today. Judge Moskoff is chair of the Subcommittee on Judicial Statistics, which sounds like you brought us here also. Judge Dana Sabra is the district judge of the Southern District of California, and I think heir apparent to run that district, as I understand it, if you choose not to retire, which at your young age you should. And with all fairness, uh, the judge and I go back to his days as a, a practitioner before he went to the state and then the federal bench. So it is truly an honor to have somebody with so many years uh, experience that I've gotten to watch. Uh, and lastly, we have Mr. Sam Kahn, or Samuel Kahn. He's chairman and CEO of Kent Holdings and Affiliates. He is a practitioner of great length and is here because I felt that in addition to three judges saying we need more judges, it'd be nice to have somebody who could talk about the delays before the court caused by not having enough judges. As you probably know from watching C-SPAN, your written statements will be included in their entirety, and so we ask you to spend as much time as you want within five minutes <laughs> saying whatever would revise and extend those, uh, those statements. Judge Stick. Chairman Issa 
and Ranking Member Johnson and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm Lawrence Stengel. I'm the Chief Judge of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and I serve as Chair of the Judicial Conference Committee on Judicial Resources. I am pleased to be joined this morning by Judge Moskoff and Judge Sabral uh, and by Mr. Khan. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, let me thank you for your invitation uh, for us to appear today uh, to discuss the Article III judgeship needs of the federal judiciary. The Judicial Resources Committee of the Judicial Conference is responsible for all issues of human resource administration, including the need for Article III judges in the U.S. Courts of Appeals and the District Courts. Our testimony today has three purposes. The first is to identify for you the judgeship needs of the district and appellate courts. Secondly, to explain the process by which the conference determines those needs. And third, to assist Congress in understanding the implications of the judiciary being understaffed. I will address our judgeship request and the justification for that request. Judge Moskoff will address in more detail our process and Judge Sabra will be able to provide details of how a district with judgeship needs is affected and the consequences of unmet judgeship requirements. Every other year, the Judicial Conference conducts a survey of the judgeship needs of the Courts of Appeals and the District Courts. The latest survey, which was conduct completed in March of 2017, resulted in a recommendation to Congress to establish five new judgeships in one Court of Appeals and 52 new judgeships in 23 district courts. The conference also recommended that eight existing temporary district court judgeships be converted to permanent status. The last comprehensive judgeship bill for the U.S. Courts of Appeals and the district courts was enacted in 1990. Similar or smaller targeted bills were considered between 1999 and 2003 when Congress created 34 additional judgeships in the district courts. Prior to 1990, Congress was fairly regular in addressing increasing caseloads and the judiciary's needs. For example, judgeship bills were enacted in 1966, in 1970, 1978, and again in 1984. It has now been 15 years since the last judgeships were established. From 1990 to the end of fiscal year 2016, when we were conducting our resource needs survey, filings in the courts of appeals had grown by 40%, while district court case filings had risen by 38%. As discussed in our written testimony, for district courts, we initially apply a standard of 430 weighted filings per judgeship to gauge the impact uh, of the uh, workload on a district. For the 27 district courts where the conference is recommending additional judgeships or conversion of existing temporary judgeships, weighted filings averaged 577 per judgeship, and 20 courts have caseloads above 500 weighted filings, eight above 600, six above 700, and one with more than 1,000 weighted filings. These are well beyond our standard of 430 weighted filings for considering new judgeships. The lack of additional judgeships, combined with the growth, growth in caseload, has created enormous difficulties for many courts across the nation. But it has reached urgent levels in five district courts that are struggling with extraordinarily high and sustained workloads. The severity of the conditions in the Eastern District of California, the District of Delaware, the Southern District of Florida, the Southern District of Indiana and the Western District of Texas require immediate action in our view. The Judicial Conference urges Congress to establish new judgeships in these districts as soon as possible. The Judicial Conference recommendation, which addresses our total needs, has not yet been introduced in the current Congress as a comprehensive judgeship bill. However, smaller individual judgeship bills have been introduced. Our written testimony identifies those bills, and we appreciate the interest of Congress as expressed in those measures. The Judicial Conference is grateful uh, for congressional action to extend temporary judgeships and is supportive of legislation similar to bills introduced in the last Congress and currently pending in the Senate to convert temporary judgeships to permanent status. 
As we review our needs, the Judicial Conference does not recommend or wish indefinite growth in judgeships. Our request has been thoroughly reviewed, is based on a careful analysis of qualitative and quantitative information, and recognizes that the growth in the judiciary must be carefully limited and planned and be fully justified. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today and thank you for your continued support of the federal judiciary. I will be happy to respond uh, to your questions. And that will wait, Judge Moskov. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Judge Rosalind Moskov, sitting on the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. And I'm also chair of the Judiciary Subcommittee on Judicial Statistics. I appreciate the opportunity today to discuss the process by which we determine Article III judgeship needs of the federal judiciary. Our joint written statement, along with the attachments to that testimony, provide a thorough description of our process and results. But I think it would be useful to the subcommittee and to the Judiciary Committee as a whole to provide some highlights of how we reached our recommendation for 57 new judgeships and the conversion of eight temporary judgeships to permanent status. In developing those recommendations for consideration by Congress, the Judicial Conference, through its committee structure, uses a formal process to review and evaluate Article III judgeship needs. Every other year, the Judicial Conference conducts a survey of the judgeship needs of the U.S. Courts of Appeals and the U.S. District Courts. The latest survey was completed in March of 2017. Before a judgeship recommendation is transmitted to Congress, it undergoes careful consideration under a multi-level process. The six-step review process begins with the individual court reviewing its needs and making a request. The subcommittee I chair then conducts a preliminary review. Once this review is complete, the subcommittee's recommendation and the court's initial request are forwarded to the Judicial Council of the circuit in which the court is located. Upon completion of the Circuit Council's review, the Subcommittee on Judicial Statistics conducts a final review of the request. The Subcommittee then submits the recommendation to the full Committee on Judicial Resources. And finally, the Judicial Conference of the United States considers the full Committee's final product. For the 2017 survey, the courts requested 66 additional permanent judgeships and the conversion of nine temporary judgeships to permanent, our review procedure reduced the number of recommended additional judgeships to, 20, to, I'm sorry, to 57 and conversions to eight. The recommendations developed through this review process are based in large part on standards related to the caseloads of the courts. They represent the caseload at which the conference may begin to consider requests for additional judgeships, the starting point in the process, not the end point. The caseload standards used by the Judicial Conference are expressed as filings per authorized Article III judgeship, which importantly assumes that all vacancies on the court are filled. For appellate courts, we use a standard of 500 adjusted filings per panel as the starting point. For district courts, we initially apply a standard of 430 weighted filings per judgeship to gauge the impact on the district. And in smaller courts, we use a standard of 500 weighted filings per judgeship. Weighted filings are used as a means of accounting for the varying complexity of different types of civil and criminal filings and real differences in the time required for judges to resolve various types of civil and criminal actions. Rather than counting each case as a single case, weights are applied based on the nature of the cases. The total for weighted filings per judgeship is the sum of all weights assigned to the civil cases and criminal defendants divided by the number of authorized judgeships. 
in, in 2016, the Judicial Conference approved updated case weights for the district courts. Caseload statistics alone are not fully indicative of each court's needs. Other court-specific information is considered to arrive at a sound measurement of each court's judgeship needs. And this would include factors such as the number of senior judges available to a specific court, available magistrate judge resources and the use of visiting judges, geographic factors, unusual caseload complexity, temporary caseload increases, and other factors noted by the courts. In conclusion, over the last 25 years, the, ju the Judicial Conference has developed, adjusted, and refined the process for evaluating and recommending judgeship needs in response to both judiciary and congressional concerns, using an objective standard as a starting point and considering other court-specific factors allows us to develop recommendations that are carefully reviewed in a multi-step process. This ensures that the recommendations of the Judicial Conference are limited to the number of new judgeships that are necessary to exercise federal court jurisdiction. Once again, I thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to appear today and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Judge Shabra. This is a large courtroom, so we recommend the mic. Good morning, Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the committee. I'm Judge Dana Sabra from the Southern District of California. I'm particularly delighted to be here at Chairman Issa's uh, request uh, and to speak to the issues of additional judgeships. I would like to start by giving an overview of the national trends as reflected in our caseload statistics, which reflect an increasing demand on the judiciary since the last judgeship bill was uh, enacted in 2003. I also know the chairman is particularly interested in the situation in California, and I'm delighted to speak to that issue as well. Uh, federal court management statistics since 2003, the last judgeship bill, to March 31, 2018, show the number of total cases filed in the nation has risen by 15.5%. In California, where we have 10% of the nation's caseload, we've seen an increase of 13.5% in case filing since that period of time. The, uh, in my own district, in the Southern District of California, we've seen an increase of 21%, and we've seen weighted filings increase by 33% since 2003. Based on the most recent data, we also expect weighted filings in the Southern District of California to increase, which will, of course, uh, make the additional need for judgeships even greater. The effect of this kind of increase in caseload are profound. Increasing caseload lead to significant delays in the consideration of cases. Caseloads, particularly with respect to civil cases, often takes years to get through the uh, trial court. In most districts across the nation, it takes about two years to adjudicate civil cases from filing to trial. In these impacted districts, we see that cases are taking three and four years. In particular, in the Eastern District of California, uh, cases are taking 40 months on average to go through trial. And in San Diego, uh, cases are taking as long as 36 months, which is far too long. These delays increase expenses for civil litigants. Uh, they also may increase the time criminal defendants are held pending trial. Uh, the delays lead to an erosion of trust in the judiciary and to the judicial process itself. And the problem is so severe that potential litigants are even avoiding federal court altogether. The workload situation in each of the four California districts is severe. Uh, weighted caseloads are well beyond the national average of 430, and indeed they exceed 500 in each of the four districts in California. The weighted caseload exceeds uh, 700 in the Eastern District, which is uh, one of the highest in the nation and has been so for many, many years. 
and unfortunately, the situation in the Eastern District was made worse when the district lost one of its temporary judgeships in 2004. This contributed to a significant increase in pending cases in that district as well. One cannot imagine the situation will improve on its own without additional judges. Looking at just one area in particular, immigration enforcement, the increase in caseload has been staggering. Uh, in addition, some immigration bills currently pending before Congress will further increase the workload of federal courts along the border by adding more law enforcement personnel and prosecutors. If Congress authorizes additional immigration enforcement resources to executive branch agencies, it is also critical to add additional judgeships authorized uh, so that it can handle the increased workload which will inevitably flow to those districts. Considering just the present workload, the Judicial Conference has requested 17 additional judgeships for California, seven in the Central District, five in the Eastern, three in the Southern, and two in the Northern. In addition, the conference has recommended the conversion of a temporary judgeship in the Central District, but I would add that while border states may be the focus of more targeted judgeship legislation, it is important that judgeships be addressed comprehensively across the nation to address pressing needs throughout the country. Quite simply, the problem cannot be addressed by just adding magistrate judges or asking visiting judges or senior judges to shoulder the burden. Magistrate judges have limited jurisdiction, and moreover, the judicial conference process for determining workload needs of the court fully takes into account the valuable contributions that magistrate judges, senior judges, and visiting judges are already making. Mr. Chairman, I've only highlighted some of the issues that uh, impact our courts. I'd be happy uh, to address any questions that may follow. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy you used exactly five minutes, too. <laughs> Mr. Kahn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Johnson. Uh, I'd like to go into a bit of uh, background into how we got here in California. Since the 2011 adoption of what is known as the Public Safety Realignment or Assembly Bill 109, then Proposition 47, the Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Act, which was adopted in 2014, and the Public Safety and Rehabilitation Act of 2016, known as Proposition 57, California's crime rate has increased several times more than the national average, suffering the highest increases in both violent and property crime compared to any of the other 10 largest states. Specifically, in 2015 and 2016, California suffered consecutive year increases in violent crime for the first time in 25 years. In those two years, homicide in California increased by over 15.3%. For the nation as a whole, in 2015, the violent crime rate increased 3%, while California's rate increased two and a half times as much at 7.6%. Now, by way of background, all the rates that I'm quoting are reported as number of crimes per 100,000 population. The property crime rate for the nation as a whole declined 3.4%, while California's increased 7.2%. That is, California's net change in property crime rate was 10.6% greater than the nation as a whole. Looking at the country's 10 largest states, all nine of the others had decreases in property crime. Georgia, by way of illustration, had the largest decline at 10%, while Florida had the smallest at 4.1%. California alone had an increase in property crime and a very substantial one. This impact on this, rather the impact on this increase on criminal cases referred to at the federal courts has been, to say the least, dramatic. Compared to 2014, federal criminal cases from California in 2015 increased by 161 percent. In 2016, they increased by 135 percent. And in 2017, they increased by 131 percent. And these figures do not include drug prosecutions. And by way of background, 80% of the illegal opioids in the nation pass through our southern district borders, as Judge Sobrat knows. So the question is, why have we experienced such an increase in federal filings and caseload? Well, California's public safety realignment, again, AB 109, eliminated state prison sentences for any conviction for drug dealing 
which are now punished in most cases by county jail sentences of 30 days or less. Proposition 47 converted the possession of illegal drugs in lesser quantities from a felony to a misdemeanor. And as a result, statistics indicate that while addiction rates have increased in California, drug prosecutions have declined. While federal referrals of drug cases have fluctuated between 1,900 and 2,500 over the past five years, the incentive for county sheriffs and district attorneys to refer cases involving drug dealing to the federal court system is increasing alarmingly. As repeat offenders continue to churn through the state system again and again, and are back on the streets after a few weeks after initial arrest. Finally, in several other areas of the law, including environmental, criminal immigration, and utilization of federal natural resources, California has, of course, publicly proclaimed its intention to resist both the enforcement of federal policy and federal law with petitions for federal injunctive relief. These cases often take many years to litigate, taxing the resources of the federal courts. To cite but one example, the case of Habeas Corpus Resource Center adverse the Department of Justice, an entirely extra-legal 2013 injunction by a federal district judge in California blocked enforcement of the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which was signed into law in 1996, wasting three years of court time before it was unanimously rejected by the Ninth Circuit in 2016. We have a, immigration, a fantastic increase in immigration caseload, and as a result, and this hasn't quite yet hit the statistics, the petitions for habeas corpus were going to be increasing as well, therefore driving more federal referrals. We also have, I believe that this is something that we've talked about previously, Mr. Chairman, matters involving intellectual property, trademark matters, and the like, both in the Southern District and in the Northern District, that are very complex and take many years to be adjudicated. The vacancies of both the district court and appellate court levels in the Ninth Circuit are delaying justice to the millions of people in its jurisdiction. The current situation is intolerable, actually punishing litigants who suffer the misfortune of not living in one of the other circuits. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go uh, in order uh, for questioning. And I would recognize the senior member present here today, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. Um, Judge Stengel, I'll, I'll begin with you if I can. Um, magistrate judges carry a significant part of the uh, judicial workload in many, but not all districts. Um, would you discuss the role that uh, magistrates uh, play uh, in some districts, uh, and, and why are some districts more willing to uh, delegate the workload uh, to magistrates than others? Uh, the utilization of magistrate judges varies from district to district. Uh, I'm in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Uh, our protocol for the use of magistrate judges differs from the district court across the river, New Jersey, or a little bit different from Delaware. Uh, it's, it's fairly individualized. Uh, the magistrate judges uh, historically uh, conduct settlement conferences. Uh, they do trials by consent. Uh, in some of the more progressive courts, I'll use that term, the magistrate judges are uh, actually on the assignment wheel uh, and, uh, uh, and take on some of the, uh, of the civil load. That's not, uh, that's not in the majority of, of courts. When we do our judgeship assessment, uh, we do not count the uh, uh, contributions of the magistrate judges. Uh, we look at uh, the, the workload of the district courts, uh, the weighted caseload per district judge, uh, and then uh, when we come to uh, uh, a, a, a number as to, as to what their weighted caseload is, and then we look at how they involve magistrate judges, how they involve visiting judges, how they involve uh, senior judges, uh, in determining whether their request for additional resources uh, is, is reasonable. So you're, you're absolutely right to identify a difference among the districts, uh, and uh, there is a judicial conference magistrate judge committee uh, which helps courts uh, uh, with uh, the more effective uh, utilization of their magistrate judges in their work. Thank you very much, Judge. And you use the word progressive uh, courts. Uh, I used to consider myself progressive, but then the term got 
turned around up here and politicized, so uh, I don't use it that much anymore, but I, I understand what you meant by it. Um, uh, Judge uh, Muscoff, I'll, I'll turn to you next. Um, how has the ability for judges uh, to select senior status um, impacted the judiciary and its workload? Well, certainly when uh, one of our colleagues takes senior status, that creates a vacancy on the court. So we look forward to the presidential and congressional prerogative to fill that seat. Um, but senior judges um, contribute significantly to the work of the federal district courts. My court is a very good example. We have 14 senior judges. Um, they carry a caseload equivalent to 10 active judges. So our senior judges, not just in my court, but across the country, continue to be very active in the management and, and, and resolution of both criminal and civil cases. We consider the contributions of senior judges in courts before we make our recommendations for permanent judgeships. Thank you very much. And I've got about a, not quite two minutes left, so I'm, I'm gonna open this question up to anybody that'd like to take a stab at it. Are there other uh, changes by the uh, judicial system, such as greater use of technology, for example, or uh, changes to procedural rules that could help to reduce the current uh, backlog of cases? And whoever would like to take it, Go right ahead. Judge. I know that many courts have employed robust alternative dispute resolution systems. Our magistrate judges are often involved in settlement discussions. Uh, my court in particular has um, um, a very large mediation program employing outside practitioners to help mediate cases. So I think the federal judiciary looks at ways to try and expedite uh, the backlog of cases we have, particularly on the civil side. We always do uh, a particularly good job of prioritizing the criminal cases because of the issues at stake there. But um, we're always looking inward um, for technology, for other ways uh, to resolve the disputes and to clear the backlogs that we have. Thank you very much. I got a little time left. Um, Judge Stengel, did you want to? Just to add to that, in, in some districts, uh, particularly those with, with patent heavy caseloads, uh, the district judges have taken to putting time limits on trials. So they'll give the plaintiff 20 hours, they'll give the defendant 20 hours, uh, and they stick to those. Uh, and they have somebody in the courtroom who runs a clock. Uh, that's a, uh, uh, a case management uh, a technique that's been very efficient uh, in, in those uh, lengthy, complex cases. Kind of like playing chess. There you go. It'd be a lot longer if we didn't put limits on that when you do it. And Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Go back. Well, I thank the gentleman. And I, and I do wonder uh, if you had one claim being adjudicated or 1,000 claims, how you'd feel about the same 20 hours. <laughs> and with that, we go to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge Stengel, uh, did the latest survey of the needs of the U.S. Court of Appeals and U.S. District Courts completed by the Judicial Conference in March 2017 produce any unexpected findings? I don't know that the findings were, were unexpected. Um, we have a, a tremendous growth uh, in, uh, uh, in the caseloads in certain courts. We do this process every two years, uh, and so we were able to identify trends. Uh, uh, but in terms of the, uh, uh, the caseload in New Jersey, uh, the caseload in Delaware, and the caseload in certain of the districts in California, uh, those continue to grow at, at a fairly dramatic uh, rate. There have been some changes in the law uh, that have, uh, uh, that have uh, led to that. Uh, the T.C. Hartland decision, uh, which has to do with venue in a patent case, uh, has uh, had an impact on the uh, District of Delaware. Uh, the, uh, uh, the continued growth in multi-district litigation, uh, at this time about 35% of the civil litigation in this country is in the MDL process. Uh, uh, states like uh, New Jersey, uh, where a number of the pharmaceutical uh, companies are, have their principal place of business and are incorporated 
get an inordinate uh, number of those uh, cases. So that's something that, uh, that, we are, uh, that we are tracking. Judge Moskoff, you may want to comment on the, uh, the survey process in terms of any surprises. We have no expectations in the survey process. As Judge Stengel said, we do keep our eye on trends and have a sense of the shifting caseload across the country. But our recommendations are empirically based, based on the data, uh, caseload data, as of the time that we do the recommendations. Thank you, uh, Judge Sabral. Uh, what are the implications when the judiciary is understaffed? Well, I can speak to that uh, in the Southern District uh, in particular with uh, Operation Streamline coming. Uh, we are one of the only, we are the only court on the border that doesn't currently have Operation Streamline. And so when- Can you, can you explain what Operation Streamline yes, is? Yes, that will be a result of the zero tolerance policy and the immigration enforcement. So we are expecting, for example, the U.S. Attorney to bring in 75 to 100 cases each day in our court. And so it will clearly impact the level of resources we can devote to those types of cases. These will be misdemeanor cases uh, brought against uh, persons uh, coming across the southern border? Yes, sir. They, they will be uh, under 8 U.S.C. Section 1325 misdemeanors, by and large. And is it true that uh, in uh, the case of misdemeanors coming before the uh, U.S. District Courts that there is a right to uh, have bonds set in those cases? That is absolutely true. They do have a right to a bond determination. It is uh, different calculation from a felony filing, but they have a right to a bond hearing. Where it impacts- They have a, they have a right to a bond to be set uh, yes. for them. Is that yes. correct? They do. They have a right to a bond determination and to have a bond set. And the impact- and that has to be an individualized determination as to uh, the bond. It can't be like a preset bond, but it has to uh, basically uh, be an individualized consideration before the judge sets a bond. That's exactly right. It has to consider flight risk, danger to the community. There is no presumption of detention. So bond is a very important consideration, particularly for low-level offenders like misdemeanors. I would like to say it does increase the workload for district judges because what we're seeing is a number of appeals of bonds from the magistrate judges to the district judges and our district judges in the Southern District are on the wheel for misdemeanor trials, though we don't have to do that. It is a way to best utilize resources and serve our community. So basically, Operation Streamline has the uh, potential to gum up the workings of the uh, operation of the Southern District of uh, California um, it will have a dramatic impact. We are presently trying to staff the influx of cases that we anticipate. Uh, as I mentioned, the U.S. Attorney anticipates bringing in as many as 75 to 100 cases per day. So per we will day. need additional magistrate judges, additional courtroom space, and of course interpreters, CJA attorneys, federal defenders. It has a, a court-wide impact for sure. Now, what about juveniles? Will juveniles who've been separated from their parents be coming before the uh, district court also? I don't anticipate that. Most of the juveniles who are separated are, are processed separately through various statutes. They're held through Office of Refugee Resettlement. Most of them are detained pending removal proceedings. We would only see juvenile offenders if another crime is committed. For example, if they have drugs on their person or uh, in our district, it's not uncommon to have a juvenile come across with a backpack of marijuana. Those types of offenders would come into our court, but they are relatively rare. I thank you all for your testimony today, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, just because I'm not familiar with this, and his question was, was very germane, uh, people who, uh, who have come unlawfully over the border, it's only a misdemeanor, but when you're giving a consideration to a bond, uh, is there some sort of statistical likelihood on average of how many of these people will show up if you grant a bond? 
I know that that is heavily debated. I don't have those statistics. It's, it's, I'm simply looking as a judge and giving an individualized consideration what flight risks are, uh, what the danger to community is. The statistics I know uh, Department of Justice and others have, but we don't have those. Thank anymore. you. We now go to the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the panel for being here today. Idaho is in urgent need of another federal judgeship. The last time Idaho received an Article III judgeship was in 1954. This 64-year wait is unprecedented, and it keeps getting longer, obviously. My concern isn't just about the timing. Over the past six decades, Idaho's population has nearly tripled in fact, the U.S. Census recently announced that Idaho is the fastest growing state in the country. And in March, Forbes magazine named Idaho's capital, Boise, the fastest growing metro area in the United States. Despite this impressive increase, Idaho still has fewer judgeships than states such as Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, Maine, and South Dakota, all who have smaller populations and or smaller weighted caseloads. Idaho's insufficient number of Article III judges is also surprising in light of the fact that its docket continues to outpace those of other similar communities and courts. Since 2001, criminal filings in Idaho have increased by 163% and by 41% over the last three years alone. Also due to the recent announcement of two new, new U.S. attorneys for Idaho, the number of criminal cases will only increase. Further, despite a national trend of a reduction in civil cases, the number of civil filings in Idaho has remained relatively consistent over the last 10 years. This extremely heavy caseload is currently being managed by three federal judges, two who are full-time and one who is in senior status. The senior judge carries only a 75% caseload and obviously could retire any day. In fact, I think the reason he hasn't retired is because we don't have an additional judge. Once he retires, one of the two remaining judges plans to take senior status with a reduced caseload, leaving only one full-time Article III judge in the District of Idaho, and thereby creating an immediate judicial emergency. Federal, federal judges from neighboring state districts have acted as visiting judges to alleviate the burgeoning caseload in Idaho. In 2017 alone, the District of Idaho engaged the help of 25 visiting judges. Between 2012 and 2017, visiting judges spent over 832 hours away from their own states to hear federal cases in Idaho. While their temporary assistance is appreciated, it has created uncertainty among litigators who struggle to prepare cases for these particular judges about whom they know very little, if anything. Finally, the burden of Idaho's massive geography is an important factor for the conference to consider when issuing its decision about a new judgeship. The entire state of Idaho is one district that encompasses over 83,000 square miles and two time zones. Additionally, the state is subdivided into three divisions, each with their own federal courthouse. Traveling with, between these three venues includes stretches of 222 to 458 miles. And air transport is not an option in some of those, air, in some of those cases. This is roughly the equivalent to driving between Washington, D.C., Pittsburgh, and Boston. The federal judges in Idaho spend significant amounts of time traveling between the three courthouses. I know you're aware of all these things, but I just wanted to emphasize how important the dire need that we have in Idaho is. Judge Stengel, given these facts, what is your response to Idaho's need for a third Article III judgeship? The Judicial Conference strongly supports an additional permanent judge for the District of Idaho, Idaho for the reasons that you cite. Uh, the, the caseload, the weighted caseload, uh, certainly supports the additional judgeship. Uh, and when I talked earlier about uh, qualitative and quantitative factors, the qualitative factor here uh, uh, that is so profound uh, is the distance uh, that the judges are required to travel among the divisional offices. Uh, uh, you correctly state it's 222 miles and 458 miles, uh, and that uh, is, is an extraordinary uh, burden uh, on, on those judges. Uh, so, so we're well aware of, of, of those factors and strongly support the, the additional permanent judge in Idaho. Thank you. And why has Idaho had to wait longer than any other state for an additional federal judge? I really can't speak to, uh, 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 we, we do the, 
the survey every two years, uh, our recommendation for Idaho, I think, has been uh, consistent. Uh, I, don't, I can't speak to uh, why that has not been acted on. As you're looking at your determination, does the conference consider that justice may not adequately be served when a state has an insufficient number of federal judges? There's no question. And that's, that's why it has uh, such an emergent nature, uh, not only in the, the courts with judicial emergencies, which deals more with vacancies, uh, but in the uh, courts such as uh, your state, uh, where uh, uh, justice delayed is justice denied, and, and the fact that the resources are less than they need to be uh, is a problem with the administration of justice. As you know, we have some amazing judges in the state, and they're doing the best they can with the resources Absolutely. that they have. Um, I have a bill before this Congress trying to get an additional judgeship, and I hope that we can get that done, uh, hopefully before the end of the year. Thank you very much for your time. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Would this presume that you embrace uh, equally the other recommendations of the Judicial Conference in a combined bill that would, uh, among other things, reduce by one the Wyoming judgeship, which apparently is the pay for for your getting this additional one? Is that, is that envisioned by you that they're, they're not only right in your case, but they're right in all cases? I, I will support anything that the Commission uh, advises and anything that we can get passed through this Congress. I thank the gentleman. <laughs> we now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Idaho makes a compelling case for a new federal judgeship. I commend him for that argument. Um, Mr. Chairman, when uh, Attorney General Sessions announced the adoption of a zero tolerance policy for undocumented people crossing the border, uh, any adult believed to have committed any crime, including illegal entry, as a result of that, is prosecuted for committing a crime. Now, the scope of that zero tolerance policy is expansive. It ends prioritizing the prosecution of and deporting those people who are dangerous or pose a serious threat to our national security. It now includes prosecuting not just those deemed a threat, but people who, all people who have committed the misdemeanor by crossing the border illegally for the first time. These people are now being prosecuted in federal court for a misdemeanor crime. We've talked about that already. If convicted, they're usually provided time served. However, if the person has illegally crossed the border on prior occasions, they can be sent back to jail to serve more time and are then deported from the United States. In uh, June 19th article in the New York Times that I would ask unanimous consent to submit for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, it, it's being reported that the administration's zero tolerance policy of criminally prosecuting all people crossing the border is flooding our federal courts, and we've heard some uh, of that this morning. This policy is now forcing federal judges to prioritize and divert finite resources and time to misdemeanor first-time border crossing cases while more serious criminal cases, including drug cases, human trafficking cases, and other serious federal offenses are pushed further and further down the dockets. This enormous increase in immigration cases involving illegal border crossings is especially acute along the border. Uh, Texas, Arizona, and California have seen federal courts, uh, Judge Sabra, you touched on this, overrun with criminal prosecutions of undocumented immigrants. In fact, in this article reports that in Tucson, the court has already heard 6,519 immigration cases this year. For comparison, during all of last year, the Tucson court heard 10,869 immigration cases. It also reports a study by Syracuse University that found that the zero tolerance policy has caused federal criminal prosecutions of undocumented immigrants to increase along the southwest border by 30% in April over March. Almost 60% of all federal criminal prosecutions in April were for violations of immigration law. So the massive increase in cases has forced the federal courts to pursue uh, what is referred to, uh, Judge Sabra, as Operation Streamline, what others have referred to as an assembly line of justice approach. I'm not sure who uh, gave it that name, the uh, Operation Streamline, because from, from what we've read, the reporting says that immigrants often appear in court in large lines to have their cases quickly disposed of in, uh, in one plea. Now, federal courts have been forced to resort to this form of dispensing justice. The large number of, being, large number of people being prosecuted also is burdening not just the federal judges, but the courtroom staff clerks, attorneys, interpreters, marshals, and other security staff, as well as the actual courthouses and the facilities. Many people, many of these people appearing in federal court are fleeing from their home countries to seek safety in our country. They're fleeing horrific violence and deadly gangs, and this is now how 
we treat them when they get here with a jail cell, assembly line justice, and separation from their children. This is the way we show humanity to those who are fleeing persecution and violence, and it's abhorrent. Um, I, I, the question I, I have is um, whether you're concerned that our federal courts, because we've been forced to resort to this assembly line to dispense with the enormous volume of, of misdemeanor cases, uh, misdemeanor immigration cases, uh, what the impact is on your ability to hear the cases that really present national security threats, what the, the drug cases that aren't being heard, the human trafficking cases that aren't being heard because of this policy. Uh, Judge Sabrock, can you comment on that? It, it does present a real challenge because with the flood of misdemeanor cases that come in, as I was mentioning uh, to Ranking Member Johnson, it necessitates the involvement of district judges. So we are hearing many more uh, bail review hearings. We are also conducting more misdemeanor trials. I have one on calendar a week from today. So there's no question that it does devote uh, or, or it does distract from the district judge's obligations. We can simply I'm, do I'm our, sorry, Judge, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. It distracts from which obligations? The, to tend to other cases, felony cases and civil cases. I, can I just stop for a minute? I, we've, Mr. Chairman, we've heard lots of, there's been a lot of talk over this week about the family separation policy and, the, and we've been told that we need this because we care about security and we have to, we have to pay, take seriously the rule of law. The fact is there are felony cases that are not being heard right now by our federal judges because those cases are being pushed down the docket so where you can hear these misdemeanor cases instead. I don't understand how it is that that advances our national security when all of these other cases, so many of which directly implicate our national security, dangers posed to American citizens, uh, people who have been arrested for felonies, that justice is not being served because of this policy. That's a really important point for us to acknowledge, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to engage on this topic uh, with these judges today, and I yield back. Now to my I time. thank the gentleman. Thank you for yield back. The gentlelady from California is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this, uh, this hearing. Uh, and I want to thank the witnesses for coming and taking their time uh, with us this morning. Um, Mr. Kahn, I know that you uh, are the chairman and CEO of Kent Holdings and Affiliates, and I was wondering if you could describe what that company is. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, it is a family-owned company that uh, at uh, one point in time uh, uh, was the largest, uh, one of the largest privately owned master plan community developers in the United States. Uh, and uh, it uh, still exists today in various forms uh, in developing property and owning properties throughout uh, California and Nevada. And I, I know that you have a background, I believe, in criminal justice, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I'd be happy to. Um, I'm uh, of counsel to one of the uh, largest law schools in San Diego, the Thomas Jefferson School of Law. It's co-acting dean of the school and chairman emeritus. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've served as a trustee of the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation, uh, the only full-time uh, organization in the country that stands side by side with all the United States attorneys and district attorneys in the United States on you major also criminal matters. Deputy Sheriff uh, Reserve, right? Did yes, I. Uh, yes, ma'am. I had a 25-year career with the San Diego Sheriff's Office, uh, retiring at the rank of uh, captain. When did you retire? 1995. So I was wondering if you, uh, 1995, so AB 109 was in 2005, I believe. And I was wondering if you knew, I actually was in the state legislature and was a part of AB 109. And so I recall that. I was that. wondering um, if you were aware of why AB 109 was passed, why it was an issue that was passed in California. Um, I know the highlights of it, but perhaps you could refresh my memory. Well, AB 109 and many of the criminal justice reform propositions that you mentioned was because the courts ordered the state of California to reduce the prison population. Yes. The courts ordered and took over control, uh, especially the health care of prisoners, because we were doing such a poor job as a state. And so AB 109 uh, was a response to reduce the prison population instead of the courts taking it over. So several of the reforms that you mentioned, uh, Proposition 47 and some of the others, 
you know, the verdict is, is out. Um, there was a report that was published just this month on Proposition 47, and the point of Proposition 47 was one of several measures that uh, were led by communities to do criminal justice reform in California. And so there is actually no evidence that violent crime increased as a result of Proposition 47. That's a report that was just released this month. There is some evidence that Proposition 47 impacted property crime and, uh, and that property crimes uh, have come up. But the overall crime rate in California, so when you were describing the crime rate, I was wondering, I mean, both the chairman and I are from the same state, but I didn't recognize the state you were describing because actually this report that was also released in June of this month says that the uh, California crime rates remain comparable to the low rates observed in the 1960s, even with dramatic reductions in incarceration. So one of my concerns about some of the ballot measures that we've passed is that um, we haven't passed the appropriate community-based programs to um, address that population, meaning re-entry programs. And so we definitely need to do that. But I would just uh, take issue with your, what I believed I saw was a relationship between reduce, doing criminal justice reform and a rise in crime when that doesn't really meet with what, um, you know, what reports are coming out about the crime rate in California. Would the gentleman lady yield? Um, so long as I don't lose my time, I will. Could you stop the clock for a moment? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, because I have a question. I'm, I'm, I, I'm notwithstanding Mr. Khan's testimony. Mm -hmm. You're not disputing that the federal caseload is rising uh, in California, including criminal caseload, right? No, okay. I'm not disputing that. Okay, I, I apologize. Because I don't know. I'm uh, not agreeing or disagreeing. Okay, because that. That, was, that was Judge Shabra's testimony and, and I think the statistics that uh, were given to us which is the primary reason for today's hearing. Uh, and I understand that what, we, what we I, Californians will probably debate AB and SB whatever forever, but uh, I, I just want to make that clear because so, I think so, it's important and General Lady can continue. Okay, so yeah, I'm reclaiming my time. Let me be clear, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with that. I, I don't know that. But what I heard from the witness that concerned me because California is on a trajectory of criminal justice reform that I certainly hope is followed by our federal government and that uh, I think the verdict is out in trying to say that crime has increased or the caseload has increased because of criminal justice reforms. And that's the linkage that I felt that I heard from well, the witness. Well, would the gentlelady yield? Sure. Um, I, I, thank you. I, I agree with the gentlelady. I, I heard, uh, uh, I gleaned from the comments that uh, that was uh, the, um, that was the argument that was being made, and I thought that it was um, uh, perhaps outside the boundaries of this, uh, of this hearing. Uh, I yield back. All time having expired, we now go to Mr. Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and thank you to our, our witnesses uh, for being here. I, I think, you know, I, all of us are generally inclined to support the recommendations of the conference as it relates to additional federal judges. I do think it's important to understand this request in the context in which we are currently uh, living. Uh, and that is, you know, we have a president who has nominated, you know, we all understand presidents nominate judges that reflect their political views. That's nothing new in America. Uh, but I think what we're seeing in this current administration are the presentation of judicial candidates that both lack the qualifications and have views well outside the political norms. Uh, nominees who, uh, for example, one who made a comment that he supported conversion therapy and that transgender children are part of Satan's plan. Another nominee who was incapable of articulating the Daubert standard or what emotion in limine even meant. Another nominee who uh, led efforts to bar local governments from taking down Confederate monuments. Another nominee who, during her confirmation hearing, refused to say whether Brown versus Board of Education was properly decided. So I think those of us that are interested in responding to this demand always worry that this is not a normal moment. And some of the greatest concerns that many of us have are these lifetime appointments by this administration and the impact they'll have on our country and on the society in which we live. And so if you sense some hesitation, it's I hope you recognize that's the context. The second point I want to make is what you made, uh, point you made, Judge Sorbara, that this new influx of immigration cases is 
just by definition, crowding the docket in so that serious criminal cases, things like robberies of financial institutions, crimes of violence, drug trafficking, human trafficking, terrorism cases, hate crimes, are, are uh, taking a lesser priority than uh, these uh, immigration cases. And in fact, the American Immigration Council reported uh, very recently that violations of eight United States Code 1325 and 1326, the entering the United States without documentation, have become the most federally prosecuted offenses, uh, consisting of almost half of the prosecutions in federal court. Now, Attorney General Sessions in 2017 instructed federal prosecutors to make entry-related prosecutions a high priority nationwide. And in April of this year, he doubled down on this and issued a zero tolerance policy that required each United States Attorney's Office to prosecute all uh, DHS referrals of illegal entry. So the, the, this problem is only gonna compound itself under the zero tolerance policy. And uh, when you look at the determination that the, this administration has made of prosecuting every single one of these cases and giving them a priority, my question is, what will that impact be? And is that reflected in the recommendations that the conference is making? Because this is all happening now. Has anyone looked at if these immigration bills passed that have been proposed that we're gonna vote on today, and this zero tolerance policy continues, I did notice that the places where you're asking for the greatest growth in federal judges happens to be in the border states, which I'm sure is not just a coincidence. So I'd like anyone who's willing to speak on what the impact is of this policy of, of charging every single person, even those seeking asylum with illegal entry, now becoming the highest reason for federal prosecution is the greatest number of cases, almost half the federal docket, and it's gonna explode even more. What will be the impact of that? Both on your operations in the court, but also what's, what's the impact on our country when you have, uh, have to have half your docket or more of people who are fleeing violence from Honduras or El Salvador, fleeing to protect their lives, and that has to take a priority over someone who's committed a violent crime or drug trafficking in communities where our constituents live. I think the, uh, Oh, sorry. I, no, I'd love to hear from all three of you. I, I think the, uh, the, the answer to your specific last question is, has the recommendation taken into account uh, the recent policies uh, by the administration uh, and the answer to that would be no. Uh, the, the, the assessment of the workload that, that we made uh, was completed uh, about uh, two years ago. Uh, it's no coincidence, though, that, that there are uh, recommendations for judgeships uh, in a number of the border courts because that has been a significant issue uh, with the judiciary's workload for many years. Uh, and uh, uh, those have been uh, unique among the judiciary, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, workload in Southern California, Arizona, Western Texas, uh, uh, very different from uh, the caseload in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania or Ohio, Ohio uh, or uh, uh, other uh, states uh, or districts not near the border. Uh, our judgeship recommendation takes a comprehensive look at addressing uh, judgeship needs uh, throughout uh, the nation. Uh, but, but clearly the, the immigration uh, cases have uh, for, for a number of years uh, been a, a source of concern uh, and a reason for uh, our recommendation uh, that the border states uh, have uh, additional judgeships. Could I just ask each of the panelists, is, is, does anyone disagree with the assertion that this policy of requiring prosecution and making it a high priority means that those other crimes that I've described will take less of a priority or will crowd out some part of the docket in a meaningful way? Maybe Judge Sabra, do you have a? All the judges may answer, yeah. answer briefly. Sure. I think in some courts it may. Um, I think it will definitely create a burden for every court that has an influx of these cases. And it will be up to the courts to determine whether there are efficiencies that can be employed to address these concerns, um, or how best to affect it. And in many cases, it may affect the prioritization of cases. The priority of district judges uh, is with felonies first. And in the Southern District, our felony filings have grown uh, enormously, 62% in the last year. 
It's the felonies that can displace our ability to get to civil cases, which causes delay. To be clear, the zero tolerance policy has an impact on the court, uh, but it most dramatically impacts magistrate judges because that is peculiarly within their jurisdiction. Where it occupies some of the district judge resources is as a court, we would then begin to hear more and more appeals at the magistrate judge level for bond determination. And as a court, our district judges have agreed to be on the wheel to hear misdemeanor trials. So it does uh, use additional judicial resources, there's no question. But I, I do want to be clear that our priority has always been with the adjudication of felony cases. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Tom. you. And following up, uh, because I think uh, the gentleman's uh, point is a, a question is a good one. You have an experience uh, in your court with very large amounts of, of prosecutions, particularly after the Carol Lamb replacement and the new policies during the Bush administration, where I think you were you were a little junior on the totem pole back then. Uh, you want to go through what efficiencies you've been able to find in the Southern District of California? Well, we are a patent pilot course, uh, thanks to the chairman, and... Um, uh, we'll thank Chief Judge Moskowitz for that. Yes, yes, absolutely. And as part of that process, we've engaged in um, determining how best we can uh, process civil cases, for example. So we use our magistrate judges uh, for great resources. They handle uh, settlement conferences and all of the discovery-related matters. We uh, are active in case management on civil cases, so we try to set firm uh, deadlines, including trial times. Uh, as Judge Stengel mentioned, when we adjudicate civil cases, we routinely set uh, time limits. So we believe we're uh, as efficient as we can be in handling civil cases, processing them as quickly as possible. Uh, when I was, I was alluding to uh, when, when Carol Lamb was, was fired during the Bush administration for not prosecuting, for actually having a, uh, I guess, an infinite tolerance um, nearly for undocumented, particularly not the undocumented, but particularly the coyotes. Uh, the caseload was reversed under the, the new U.S. attorney, uh, and you then had a, a large amount, particularly of traffickers, and to a lesser extent, people coming across. Uh, my understanding is uh, in San Diego, you gang, if you will, those cases. One judge gets a long day of those cases and a U.S. attorney gets a long day. Can you go through that process to the best, you know, put it into the record? What's happening presently is in a state of flux. We are working with the U.S. Attorney's Office to establish the Operation Streamline process. We are the only border court of the five that does not currently have Operation Streamline. So we are using Arizona uh, as a good example, because it's within the Ninth Circuit and there's good uh, circuit court case law as to what we can and cannot do. We cannot engage in mass shackling. We have to have a full and robust Rule 11 plea colloquy uh, with uh, each of the persons appearing. So we, uh, that imposes limitations on our ability to handle large numbers of cases. Arizona, for example, caps out its uh, processing at 75 per day. Per judge. Per magistrate judge. They dedicate one magistrate judge to one courtroom and they do 75 uh, misdemeanor cases per day. We likely will model parts of our system after the Arizona system. It will occupy one, perhaps two magistrate judges per day, one or two courtrooms per day. And then as I mentioned, the shift in the workload for district judges is the amount of appeals and misdemeanor trials that will come from the influx of 75 to 100 misdemeanors. So, uh, and I, I'm going to recognize Mr. Cicilline for a follow-up, but so if I understand the process both in Arizona and as it will be in, in San Diego and other areas, uh, the, the initial front end of the processing the decision that there is zero tolerance, that everyone who breaks the law is held accountable to either plea and leave, or, or plead guilty and leave, or plead innocent and go through a process, first with the magistrate and if they really want to with an Article III judge, uh, that the front end of the process is, is pretty efficient. You can, you can plead out and be gone uh, very quickly. 
uh, but there's a record rather than simply a removal with no record so that somebody coming in six, seven, eight times technically has never been convicted of a misdemeanor. That, that's the difference that this 75 a day in front of a magistrate creates. Is that correct? Yes, it's front-loaded by and large. Most of the misdemeanors will enter a guilty plea and be sentenced and then uh, serve a 15 to 45 day Or just sentence. be, they're already gone that long, they're out. Yes, it could be a time-served sentence. The, uh, some of the defendants may elect not to plead guilty, and there the U.S. Attorney has the ability in certain cases, depending on uh, criminal history and number of prior illegal entries, they can then charge a felony, the so-called flip cases. So going through the, this question of, and I don't want to deal with the zero tolerance, but I do want to deal with the process, if you will, because I think that's where there's an important question that led to zero tolerance. If you have a zero tolerance and people continue to come across the border, eventually these are not misdemeanors, but rather repeat offenders who are charged with felonies. Is that correct? Yes. So if you don't have zero tolerance, you never get to the felony, and you end up with people who are not dissuaded from continuing to come over the border until they get away with it, basically, correct? Well, I'm, I'm not in a position to comment on the charging decision. It is my understanding that if a person has a number of prior uh, illegal entries and no prior criminal history, that they may be charged on a felony count. I am not certain of that, but uh, there are many nuances in that regard. Sure, but you have certainly seen cases where somebody has, is habitual and is being charged with a felony, is that correct? The, uh, from my understanding is the government in the past has focused on recidivist offenders, those with underlying criminal history, or those who are committing a felony in addition to illegal entry, sure, like smuggling drugs. Smuggling drugs or the actual uh, coyote activities of bringing yes. people across. Mr. Cicilline, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I just wanted to make a point. This, this front-ended position, which I think you're questioning, uh, Mr. Chairman, suggests it was sort of a routine or efficient process. I want to just underscore the entry of a guilty plea or a plea of any kind and the advisement of rights, particularly with the use of a translator. This is a labor-intensive process that has to be done well and can't be done in large groups and having practiced criminal law for many, many years. The, the initial appearance, the bond determination, and a plea is a time-intensive process that for 75 or 100 people is an enormous uh, devotion of resources. So I well, wanted to make that point. No, and, and, and I'll give you additional time, but the reason I asked the question the way I did is that policies change from time to time. My question and the, the nature of this hearing is making the case for the need for 66 additional judgeships. And, uh, and so that's why the question is, how much time does it take and where are the efficiencies? And that's why when Mr. Uh, Judge Sabra answered that the major vast majority of this goes to magistrates, uh, I think uh, for uh, Judge Stiegel, that means that there wasn't a lot loaded into it for the front end, only for those who then obviously want to be in front of an Article III judge, which is part of his calculation and, and I think part of your statistics. Uh, but did you have one yeah, more Yeah, the, the second point I wanted to make is, uh, we, you know, early this morning on this very subject, we had an official statement from the President of the United States by way of Twitter, which is a statement of the President, uh, that and without reads, objection, that statement will be placed in no, the record. No, I'd like to place in the record. We shouldn't be hiring judges by the thousands, as our ridiculous immigration law demands. We should be changing our laws, building the wall, hire border agents and ICE, and not let people come into our country based on a legal phrase that they are told to say as their password. Of course, everyone is free to interpret that in any way you want, but I thought it should be part of the record. And without objection, it will be part of the record. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you had one final uh, follow-up. Thank you, uh, Judge Chaparral. Um, so Ninth Circuit practice is uh, 75 cases per uh, day per magistrate. That's the Under Arizona Operation District Streamline. Court, Arizona District Court practice. Mm -hmm. Which probably the uh, Southern District of California will adopt. We are looking at that issue. Because that's about uh, when and an average magistrate works, what, about eight hours a day? Yes. Uh, including lunch for the hour? Depends on their duties. Uh, 
Often the hardworking magistrates in the Southern District would probably say they work far beyond that. Well, I, I, think, uh, much. I think just taking, uh, taking it from the standpoint of eight hours a day, 75 cases per judge per day, that equals about six minutes per case. And uh, for a misdemeanant uh, coming before the magistrate uh, for a uh, determination as to whether or not they're going to plead guilty or not guilty, uh, an arraignment hearing is basically what, it, what it's going to be. Yes, Correct? it would be. Uh, it could include an arraignment, uh, an advisal with respect to a Rule 11 plea colloquy. And, and so, sentencing. in other words, you, you advise them of the charge, the nature of the charge, the uh, sentence that, uh, or the range of punishment that could be imposed uh, if they plead guilty. You find out whether or not they uh, uh, can understand the uh, proceedings, and if not, you have to offer an, uh, an interpreter. Is that not correct? Yes. And. Um, and then uh, once the interpreter is in place and they understand the, what they're accused of and the range of punishment, uh, they have to be advised of their uh, right to counsel. Isn't that correct? Yes. The process contemplates many of our CJA attorney and federal defenders who are Spanish speakers, and it allots a period of time early in the morning for those attorneys to meet and counsel their clients prior to being brought into court. So the court session often occurs much later in the morning or first thing in the afternoon. So these um, misdemeanants will have already spoken to lawyers before they get to the magistrate uh, judge for their arraignment? It depends on the court, but that is the system that we are contemplating. Are you going to have to ramp up on your uh, public defenders? Absolutely do. Do you, have, do you know whether or not funding is in place for that? Uh, there presently is, uh, but we are in uh, discussions now with public or federal defenders and CJA panel attorneys to staff uh, this and, influx. And these misdemeanants, in addition to being advised of the charges against them, the range of punishment, uh, the consequences of uh, a plea of guilty or not guilty, they also have a right to a trial in the case. Isn't that correct? Yes. They have a right to a, a trial by a jury. Uh, not on misdemeanors. Be not on trial. a misdemeanor. Okay. And um, they have a right to a bench trial, which would mean witnesses uh, would have to be brought in to testify against them to make the case as to whether or not they illegally entered the country or not. Isn't that correct? Yes. And uh, after, uh, and the person during their arraignment has to. Um, to be advised that if they cannot afford an attorney, uh, uh, an attorney must be appointed or can be appointed to represent them. Yes. If they so request. They are counseled by their attorney and they're admonished by the court. So if, if all of these misdemeanants uh, charged with illegally entering the country choose to, uh, to uh, go to trial, then the magistrate would have to transfer the case to the uh, district court? For trial? That would depend on the court. Uh, misdemeanors can be exclusively handled by magistrate judges. So in some districts, the magistrate judges do all of this work. In our district, we're a very collaborative group, and our district judges have agreed to be on the wheel to handle misdemeanor trials. And then after uh, a trial, if the person accused is found guilty, uh, they have a right to appeal a uh, a conviction of a misdemeanor, is that correct? Yes. And then while they uh, are appealing the conviction, is there a right to bond uh, in a, uh, uh, for a misdemeanant convicted uh, of a misdemeanor? Uh, there can be, yes. That is a consideration that is available in all cases, including felonies. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask the, the question we've all been waiting for. Uh, Judge Sabra, we have a wall in San Diego. Uh, if we build the wall, don't we, in fact, reduce the amount of people who are in the country because they're apprehended outside the country? In other words, one of the, the virtues of the wall is, in fact, to allow the Border Patrol to do their job 
notwithstanding people who claim asylum and so on, but uh, for people who are coming over, particularly uh, in our region, the wall, in fact, pr provides some of that situation in which you don't have to hear the cases. Isn't that true? Well, I... I As a San Diegan? I wouldn't be able to, to speak to that. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm simply there as a judge to adjudicate the cases that come before me. Well, the president uh, did tweet out today that build the wall. Uh, I have been down to the border, and I, I would hope that all the federal judges would take the opportunity to see the, uh, the work that's done at the border, at least for a purpose of civil rights, and, and recognize that uh, the three-fence system does, in fact, uh, dissuade people from getting over the border. Uh, a couple of quick questions uh, in closing. Uh, we went through this, this whole question of, of, of uh, bond, uh, but people who enter the country illegally uh, have no attachment to the United States by definition in most cases. In other words, the people you see in your court and the magistrates see, they're not, in fact, connected in the United States. They don't typically have a business. They don't typically have a home. They don't typically have other things that would, which would cause them to meet the normal criteria to be entitled to be not a flight risk. Aren't those some of the criteria you have to work with any of the judges? Yeah, that's exactly right. Those are so, flight risk uh, characteristics you look to. And the statistics that are available from the Department of Ju Justice will be placed in the record if there's no objection, because I believe that they are telling that the reality is if you release these people, they thank you very much for the opportunity to accomplish what they came to accomplish, and you don't see them again, because the only penalty if they get caught is the same penalty that you were going to uh, deliver to them uh, anyway, which was removal. I want to go into one final area very briefly because we're going to put uh, some uh, proposed legislation out to deal with your request for 66 judges. Uh, what we find, of course, is 17 will be in California and the rest of the Ninth Circuit, and five will be appellates of the Ninth Circuit. So the greatest single area happens to come to the largest court. Uh, currently, there are over 30 judges on the Ninth Circuit. As a matter of fact, I think there's going to be right close to 40 uh, if we add these five additional appellate judges. So, uh, Judge Stiegel, uh, in, in, your, in, your, in your circuit, how many judges are on your appellate court? We have, I believe, 14 judgeships. 14, and they meet on banc infrequently, but they do meet on banc. Several times a year. And Judge uh, Moskov, how many are on yours? I don't know the exact number, I'm sorry to say. But you have seen your cases go before both a three-judge panel and an en banc. Yes. And Judge Sabra, do you have any similar uh, history in the Ninth Circuit? We, we have 29 active spots, and then the request, of course, is for five additional. And, well, active spots, I think there's 33 authorized, though, aren't there? I think there's a vacancies. My colleagues can correct me, but I thought there Maybe were not. 29 active. Uh, but the reality is that they don't do full-on bonks. They have never done during your tenure as a judge. They're now long tenure as a federal judge. They've never done 29 judges meeting to consider a case. So there is no such thing as full-on bonk in the Ninth Circuit. It's an 11-person panel. So you get a mini self-selected who's available, who wants to take these, uh, these cases, uh, with no particular flavor being definable as the decision of the Ninth Circuit, correct? My understanding is it's a random computer-drawn allotment of 11 judges. Okay, so you get random justice in the Ninth Circuit. Well, I, I think the computer simply identifies 11, and they may be situated anywhere within the Ninth Circuit. During the uh, tenure, uh, post uh, retirement tenure of uh, Byron White, J Justice White, he did a commission that suggested breaking administratively the Ninth Circuit into functional subsystems, each of which would be able to have en banc uh, with its then nine or ten judges. And I'd like each of you to comment on whether, assuming that we do not break up the Ninth Circuit, as there are bills to do, but rather administratively create in this case, uh, with Justice White's uh, thoughts, three divisions, each of which would be about 11 judges, 11 or 12 judges. Could I get your opinions on whether you think that would be an improvement over the randomization of a very large circuit today? I, 
I don't know if that would be uh, an improvement as a matter of judicial administration. Uh, we, we can speak only to the, the caseload demand uh, and the need for judgeships. However, those would be split up if there was to be uh, some legislation. Uh, we would support uh, the, uh, the needed resources which have been demonstrated by, by our study uh, throughout the Ninth Circuit. And, and certainly those could be split up if, if the Congress would choose uh, to do something. Well, and, and I want to follow up briefly because you've studied the utilization of resources. Yes. The Ninth Circuit, after the additional five judges, will be larger by a factor of two than any other court. Uh, in the case of each of your two uh, circuits, would you support combining your circuit with some other circuit to get the same efficiency the Ninth Circuit has, which is the alternative to dividing it? I'm, I'm afraid that may be above my pay grade. Uh, well, but from an efficiency yes. standpoint, is there some magical efficiency that the Ninth Circuit gets that your circuits don't? I'm, I'm not aware of any. So the idea of, of bigger is better doesn't particularly play in the in the Eastern District. Well, in in, in the Third Circuit, or I Third think Circuit, the, right? Yeah. The the uh, uh, certainly the processing of cases is different circuit to circuit. The Eleventh Circuit, for example, has uh, some unique uh, case management uh, approaches. Uh, but I'm talking about the it's really the efficiency of the appellate level. Uh, in addition to obviously, the Ninth Circuit has a lot more judges to move around. Right. Uh, that's, that's one of the benefits that they, they talk about. The, the only, uh, and I'll close because we are going to go vote and I don't want to keep you. Uh, and the gentleman has a couple of very short points. If you would respond for the record on if you see any efficiencies in combining adjacent circuits to be more like the Ninth Circuit versus some sort of administrative breaking up of the Ninth Circuit to enjoy the same sort of en bancs as your two circuits enjoy. I would appreciate it, and Judge Sabra, you live with it, so any comments you have would be fine. Well, I'm not on the Judicial Resources Committee, so I, I don't have the numbers. I'm not forcing you to, uh, to, to answer, though. <laughs> All I would say is that I think the efficiencies are the same circuit-wide, what uh, the Judicial Resources Committee is doing is simply looking at adjusted filings in the circuit court and then uh, empirically assigning a number of judgeships that are needed. Right. Whether Congress elects to split or divide circuits is, is within your prerogative. And so one minute because we have three minutes left on the clock. Thank you. Across the dome. Yes. Mr. Uh, I mean, Judge Sabra, I'm sorry. With the six minutes per case that a magistrate would get uh, to spend with a misdemeanor accused of coming across the border, uh, 75 in one day, so assuming eight hours a day, about uh, six minutes per case, and arraigning that uh, misdemeanor, uh, advising them of their rights, uh, the nature of the charges, the punishment, uh, that could uh, happen. Um, you also um, have to consider bond within that six minutes, too. Uh, isn't that correct? What the system contemplates is that the attorneys play a very active role at the beginning, uh, which is critical. And they advise their clients of all of their, their rights, uh, the consequences. Um, if there are no attorneys involved, though, then you're just dealing with a pro se litigant. And that may, in fact, happen uh, frequently, uh, do, you, it, do you think? In our district, it would not. All would of not. the pro se uh, criminal defendants are entitled to counsel, so they are well counseled by federal defenders and CJA okay. attorneys. So, so, it, so would, and there's a possibility that there could be an agreement as to bond for the uh, person accused. Um, and if no agreement, then the magistrate would have to consider uh, that uh, whether or not to uh, grant bond or not. The vast majority of cases will resolve in a misdemeanor disposition, so bond is not uh, considered in that respect because the defendant has elected to plead guilty. But for those who want to stand on their constitutional rights, then they may press the bond uh, issue. With and, that, and with that, the, one gentleman, last question. the gentleman will have to be extremely brief, yes. even if he runs fast. Yeah. 
there is, uh, I mean, a person coming across the border just because they're coming across the border doesn't mean that they don't have ties to the, to the community. It, it does not. Many of them do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank our guests for their patience and their brevity, uh, which allows you to enjoy your, your, your lunch. Uh, uh, the only thing I will say in, in passing is if, if any of you would like to uh, enjoy a lunch at the, uh, the members' dining room, I am happy to sponsor it. Uh, my staff will take you over there. If you have better plans, then uh, I, I thank you for your service, both to our country and to the Congress. We am I included, <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Sure, you've got an account there. We stand adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.